Uh, I think most of you are, uh, have been here before, but for those of you who haven't, um, I'm the chair of the board of the Green Technology Education Center. And uh, our goal is to inform, support, and activate communities in responding to the climate crisis. Speaking of which, yesterday, 11,000 scientists from around the world signed a declaration uh, affirming that we are indeed not only facing global warming, but we're facing a global crisis, a global climate crisis. And uh, if we don't in the next now 11 years respond definitively, collectively, um, then the planet will heat up over two degrees and the consequences will be awful, not only for the environment, for human beings, for all the creatures uh, and plants of the uh, planet, but also uh, it will result in social chaos. So it's an important, important moment for all of us and that's uh, why GTEC exists and why we're doing this series. This is the uh, fifth in the Neighborhood Environmental Education uh, Program. And I'm especially happy to have Naomi from NADA. And uh, NADA is uh, one of my favorite places to go. Uh, it's, um, I think it's a wonderful thing that you are doing. And um, one of the things that I learned from uh, the folks at NADA was that since the mid-1950s when plastic began to be manufactured, only 9% of the plastic that's been produced worldwide has been recycled. All the rest of it is in landfills or in the ocean. So what you all are doing is truly remarkable and a very important part of the larger picture. So, Naomi, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. I um, just want to say hello to everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, and once again, a big thanks to GTEC and Kitsilano House for creating this opportunity um, just to share knowledge and experiences and hopefully inspire some kind of collective action on a community level, because that is so important. Um, my name is Naomi Ryan, and I'm the event coordinator at NADA. I'm here to tell you more about how we got started and, and how a small grocery store is tackling the huge issues of food waste and plastic pollution. Um, so going way back to the beginning, this is our founder, Brianne Miller, who has had an intense love for the ocean and all the creatures in it for as long as she can remember. Um, as a kid, she would spend hours waiting in the waters, investigating tide pools and collecting interesting specimens, always being careful to return the living ones unharmed. This passion influenced every part of her life, including what she chose to study in university. Brienne became a marine biologist to understand the delicate marine ecosystems that had captivated her for so long and to better protect them from the harmful impacts of industry. But it wasn't until she was out in the field conducting research that she was confronted with the reach of this impact. Everywhere she went, she found evidence, um, sorry, she found evidence of the harmful effects of plastic pollution. On uninhabited stretches of coastline, she saw trash that had washed up on the shore, like in this picture here, and with no one to pick it up, had simply remained there. Brienne noticed that a lot of the trash she saw was packaging from food. Chip bags, candy wrappers, soda bottles, styrofoam takeout containers, the usual suspects. Not only were we continually wasting food in restaurants, grocery stores, and in our own households, the food we did consume still left behind excess packaging that is discarded with little thought about where it ends up. And this realization led her to identify two major issues, food waste and plastic pollution. And so she asked the question that would change things forever. What if food was just food again? What if we got rid of the packaging? NADA was her answer to this question. NADA, as you may know, is a package-free grocery store that aims to tackle waste at every level of the supply chain. The key issues that Brienne and co-founder Allison Carr identified in grocery stores today were unnecessary packaging. So think of when you go into a grocery store and you see one of those like English cucumbers and it's got the saran all around. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, and then disposing of food that's too ugly to sell a lot of before it even gets to the grocery store. Um, 
like perfectly edible and usable produce is just discarded because it's bruised or ugly or for whatever reason doesn't meet their standards. Um, and the other issue she saw was pre-portioning food that is too much to eat. So an example of that would be when you go to the grocery store and it seems like a cost-effective option to get one of those like giant clamshells of spinach or something, you're like, oh, this, this will be great. It's cheaper and it's, yeah. But then like how many times you just eat a small amount of that and the rest of it um, spoils in the fridge, like you don't get to it in time. So these like pre-portioned amounts um, are often just too much and people can't purchase the amount that they would actually use. So um, some of the primary foundational ideas behind NADA, I'm sure you guys have heard of reduce, reuse, recycle, the three R's. Um, they're kind of like put on equal level of, <laughs> of importance. Um, so we kind of, it's, it's been done before, but Rianne, I, I believe, added brought to this one and kind of created a little bit of a hierarchy here. So you can see um, the first step is that we highlight is to try to like refuse items that you don't need. That can look like if you're walking down the street and someone's handing out pamphlets for what have you, you know, like anything like that, you can choose to refuse those items. You don't have to take that. Um, also reducing your consumption just in general is important. Um, and then for what you do consume, trying to find alternative uses afterward at the end of, or as opposed to just discarding it. Um, and reusing those same products over and over again mm -hmm. until their end of life cycle, until they're just completely unusable. Um, so like old yogurt containers, you know, a lot of times we just put those in the blue bin. Um, but as Arden mentioned, <laughs> like only 9% of those, those materials actually are recycled. So it's, it might be better to keep those um, outside of that system entirely. Um, and then next, of course, is recycling because it is important, right? We do the, it's recycling consciously and knowing the process in, in your municipality, which is complicated, you know, you gotta do a little bit of research. Um, but yeah, it involves like separating items properly and that's kind of like a last resort. And also rotting is when you can't recycle an item, anything like contaminated, food, paper, or things like that, then you can then compost those items. Um, so through these kind of primary um, pillars, we identified the uh, th four key areas of focus and developed solutions based on these areas. So it's retail, technology, supply chain innovation, and community outreach. First and most, First and most obviously, not as a grocery store. We strive to offer many of the items that a traditional grocery store would offer, just without the plastic. By providing this option, we are allowing consumers to vote with their dollar. If there is more of a demand for a lower waste alternative, manufacturers and distributors will take notice. Something that seems niche or novel could become normal if people see that it works, if people have an example, um, and it's like, in their, in their consciousness, you know? Um, for instance, organic and local um, were not always terms that were advertised, right? But now it's kind of, it's almost like ubiquitous or expected that it's a part of your grocery store experience. We also found since opening that um, people want this kind of, this kind of system. Like they, it's, they are aware um, of, of packaging waste. It's not, especially, especially we found older people who maybe grew up um, while, the, while, the, while packaging was kind of shifting from everything being uh, reusable to disposable. <laughs> like that's, it's a recent shift and it's not something in my memory, but it's important to remember that that's like only in the last 50 years or so. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, it's like people, people are aware that this is a problem and they don't want to create this waste, but they also don't have alternative options, right? There's, there's food security issues. So depending on your neighborhood, you can only access um, certain grocery stores and your options are really limited in that sense. You can only get the, the vegetables that are packaged in plastic. Um, 
So that's what we found by setting up this grocery store is that the people who come in are really excited to have this option um, and kind of surprised that, it's, that it could exist. You know, like they didn't believe that it was possible. Um, another one of our solutions is a technological one. So this is kind of what we're most known for, I would say. Um, like bulk shopping has existed forever, right? But kind of the central innovation of NADA is that you can bring your own containers. And the way this is possible is because we have these little t chips, they're in stickers. And they have, it's like an RFID chip. It's the same thing that's in your uh, like compass card, for instance, it's really simple technology. Um, and you can get these ones that will stay on your container and you can go through the dishwasher and stuff. Or we have uh, just tokens that you can use once in the store that are just like fixed to a little rubber band. But essentially you, you scan this, um, weigh it, and then this chip stores the weight of your container. So you can shop, pick up all of the items that you would, and when you get to the cash register, we'll scan it again and deduct the weight of your container from your overall purchase. So you don't have to deal with um, either, have, most of the time when you're bulk shopping, you have to um, use the plastic containers that are provided. They won't even let you use your own container. And if they do, they might charge you for the weight of it um, and not accept, even if you like write the tear on the side, I've had them be like, no, <laughs> we don't think you're telling the truth, so we're going to charge you for the container. Um, so that that is a part of not that it's made it um, like a feasible model. And next up, right, it's supply chain um, innovation. So this basically looks like us choosing suppliers that align with our values and goals. Um, whether that be regenerative farming practices, uh, ethical sourcing, safe ingredients, etc. Um, so this is an example. We partner with, uh, we get our honey comes from um, Hives for Humanity. So they're a local uh, nonprofit that does amazing work in the downtown east side. They're trying to cultivate, uh, they have like an apiary and they are trying to cultivate um, honeybees that can like have a little network of hives all over the city mm -hmm. and they also um, educate people in the downtown east side like help them um, learn how to take care of apiaries and I've, I've also heard that um, the practice itself can be really therapeutic for people who have um, been through any kind of trauma it's like relaxing to have something to do with your hands um, and be around animals and in this kind of like quiet place The next step, probably closest to my heart, is uh, community outreach. And NADA wants to be in the community in as many ways as possible. We try to get people in store. Um, and we also will partner with local schools um, who will come and have tours of the store and can ask questions about uh, using less waste. So this is an example of some students. Um, that came to the store and then made a presentation afterwards. Um, another example would be like trash pickups in the park. Um, it's it's not so much the the act of like picking up the litter. I think it's more getting people getting people together and like talking about these ideas and also kind of doing getting familiar with the kind of things that people throw away. I think is really important as well. Um, and just like, yeah, getting a sense of, of like all of this kind of refuse and where it is and how it's like proliferated all over your neighborhood. Um, another, we also have screenings in store, which is a really fun one. Um, this was a screening we put on with Hoovy and Ernest Ice Cream and Dogwood. And it was actually a fundraiser for sustainability teams. So the proceeds all went um, to their collective um, organizing efforts, which was awesome. 
And this is kind of just showcasing our impact, just a numbers breakdown, if that's something you're interested in. Uh, we've diverted more than 300,000 containers from landfill. Um, another resource, we have uh, 30,000 online members of zero waste groups. So this is kind of a pet project of Allison and Breeze, and it's the Zero Waste Vancouver Facebook page. And there's a ton of people on it. It's a really great resource if you're trying to um, use less single-use plastic um, and you're, you just have like questions for, for other people. But is it Zero Waste? Zero Waste Vancouver, yeah. And, and it's a website? It's a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty, yeah, it's great because it's just, it's people in Vancouver who are all trying to figure this out themselves. Um, so it's a, it's a nice community resource in that way. And we extended that to having a zero waste meetup in the store as well that we do monthly. Um, so we'll do, we'll have a theme for that particular month. Last month it was um, creative reuse. So, and like the art of reuse. So we had people who were repurposing materials to make like really beautiful jewelry and sculptures. Um, but we've also done like a waste management um, presentation. So people, you know, from like RCBC and uh, what's the composting one? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> uh, there's also an amazing composting organization that was there. I'm forgetting right now. But um, yeah, so it'll be just like a theme that we, that we work around. And we also are totally open to people suggesting themes, um, something that you'd like to see. And uh, tons of in-store events. We've partnered with a lot of community organizations. And what's really important about that to us is there's so many amazing, like GTEC, so many amazing organizations that are um, trying to create change in their neighborhoods, um, but those organizations aren't always connected to each other. They don't always know. They can be like neighbors and be doing really similar things or benefit from each other's work, but might not necessarily know that the other one exists. Um, so that's something that's really important to us is creating events and opportunities for those kinds of organizations to come together. Um, and then last but not least, zero kilograms of surplus food sent to landfill, which is a pretty exciting one. <laughs> so this is just a lot of people, I think the takeaway that I always like to leave people with is zero waste doesn't have to be, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the concept because it seems like you have to change over completely really quickly. Um, and you assume it looks like, I don't know, like I have to trade out all my saran wrap for beeswax wraps and uh, I need like a stainless steel bottle and so, you know, instead of using disposable water bottles and like those changes um, can be made slowly and kind of one item at a time. And also, this is a really great graphic from Homo Verido, which is just an art account on uh, Instagram and she does like really amazing graphics where she talks about zero waste. You're familiar? <laughs> Someone's nodding in the back. Um, this one I love just because she talks about, she's like, oh, here's all the beautiful zero waste examples, like the Instagram influencer ones. Um, like, oh, your fancy grocery bag. Um, but then there's tons of, there's tons of things that people have been doing forever um, or that are really simple or affordable that will also achieve the same effect. Like, I put plates on top of all of my <laughs> leftovers, like I don't necessarily, a beeswax wrap thing is great, um, oh, but if you're, cool. yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, these are solutions that have been around for a long time, it's, we're using the country crock container, like the, the thing you find in your grandma's fridge and it's like full of stew, like, grandmas are the OG zero wasters, um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that is my presentation portion. Um, so I wanted to just stop talking at you guys and just kind of understand more um, why you're here. I would like to just kind of ask that question to the room, like what were you hoping to get from this evening? And then just open it up for general discussion and questions. I think that would be pretty great. Well, I'll start. Yeah, go for it. Uh, so just over the last year, uh, I've been sort of changing the way I do some things, and I realized 
the other day that I was sort of going back to my grandmother's time. And um, I went and talked the other day because I'd run out of uh, just uh, dishwasher in the sink soap. And it, had, and it was a container, and I, I sort of shook my head and thought, okay, there's got to, there's got to be a solution here because I don't want to come back home with plastic. Mm -hmm. So when I went to see, uh, I just asked one of the, because I couldn't find anything, and in the old days, they used to have bars and so, and, um, and you would just, you know, use, you would, anyways. Uh, and the, um, the automatic, uh, dishwashers can come in boxes, but when you're, and, and I suppose um, you could do that in the sink as well, but bar soap seems to work much better. So I, anyways, I went to talk with her, and we, and we sort of had to walk around the store to try and find something, and I realized, I'm just going to get some soap and see how it works, and, and it works perfectly. And then things like uh, wax cartons for milk. Mm -hmm. You know, they're wax. And here we are, you know, buying these uh, wraps, bees wraps, which, you know, also involves the bees and taking away their wax. Mm -hmm. And so eventually, maybe people will have other alternatives. But, um, you know, looking at containers like that, that, you talked about the creative part. Uh, I thought, well, if I, if I wash this so well, and depending on what I'm going to put in it, I can use that, uh, you know, for a few times before it sort of breaks down. Mm -hmm. And then things like yogurt containers. I just decided I'm going to I'm going to make my own yogurt because I can put it into glass. And um, you know, it, it's just really getting the idea and looking around your house to see what sorts of things would be easy to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And when I went into Shopper's Dark Mart, I was absolutely stunned. I really, it just sort of hit me. As I looked around, I thought, everything here is plastic. Like, uh, so I think it's really important for us to be able to go in and ask for such things. Can I, do you have this? And I'm, I'm you know, just letting the people in the store know that you are uh, looking for alternative things. I mean, when you buy meat, it doesn't have to be in a plastic wrap. Or if you, instead of getting those, you could you call them clamshells, is that what they call them? <laughs> I like that. But <laughs> instead of getting that when I get my roast ch chicken, I'm just going to cook my roast chicken. And then I don't have to have plastic mm -hmm. at all. So some of them are just little moves that may require a bit more time. Exactly. But aren't really that bothersome and 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 using different kinds of uh, wrap uh, that you, you the butchers use in the old days they used them also and they still use them so all of the, that kind of wrapping that otherwise might be you know you're looking at seepage and stuff like that um, you can you can um, you know it, it isn't a huge shift initially anyways so I think no, that's so a, no, but, no, but that's I'm really into this. I I'm totally into this, and I I really enjoy um, uh, finding opportunities to you to reuse things, particularly glass, um, because glass I know is made of sand, and then there isn't as much sand in the world as there used to be. But uh, as long as we are. Uh, recycling the glass, um, you know, it can also have a significant use. Do you actually clean your glasses and, and put them on the shelf for people to take? Glasses as in like glass jars, containers? Jars and things like that. We, do, we have um, just like glass jars for purchase that we have available. Okay. Um, we also have what I what I recommend people use because um, I know it's it's appealing to get the like pretty new glass jar and display everything in a little row. Um, but we also have a lot of containers like you're talking about like just yogurt containers or like pasta sauce jars or whatever that people come and donate to us mm -hmm. um, instead of putting them in the blue bin, mm -hmm. and we sanitize them in store and then right. put them in these free container bins. 
so that people can use them when they come into the store. Yeah. Yeah, that's one option. But you're you're right in saying that. I mean, it's just it's about reusing as much as possible. Um, I think because the recycling system is is or like it's broken, honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's complicated, yeah. and um, a lot of people. It's it's just easy to to make a to make a mistake. I think um, there's just so many things that like for instance, I learned recently. Um, you're just talking about glass that uh, like in Europe for instance mm -hmm. glass it has a really high recycling rate like most of the bottles in Europe I think are made of like 60% recycled glass mm -hmm. um, but we don't have that infrastructure in Canada or at least in BC mm -hmm. um, so when people put glass in the, in the blue bin it's not made into new glass it's right. just ground down and used for like sandblasting and stuff mm -hmm. so it's not actually being recycled and there's, there's so many little things like that that I think that if people knew, they would be really surprised, you know, that, that recycling isn't exactly what the process that they think it is. Yeah, we take, um, we take container donations in store. So it, we have a couple requirements, just that it not be too narrow of a neck, um, because it'll be hard to sanitize. And what else do we have? Oh, and then also, it, I mean, it can't be too thin or it'll melt in our dishwasher. Um, but yeah, generally we'll take pretty much all containers um, and clean them out and then people can use them again and again. And it's really cool because I've seen the same jar come back to the store like over and over again. <laughs> we put back in the free container. Not as a brand, but we're not super proprietary about it, I think. I think what, what's more important to us is that this model become more common, right? And if it's not like, yeah, if if something has a different logo on it, we'll still take it. <laughs> you know, it hasn't been that long, but um, I mean, I'm 70, and uh, my I can remember my grandmother and my grandfather, and you know, I uh, it's not such a big deal in terms of that shift because it's. One generation, like in the 50s, they started making plastic, you said. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my generation. My grandparents' generation weren't involved with plastic and things like that. They had to teach people to throw stuff away. <laughs> yeah, so, so it, it's only one generation away from mm -hmm. uh, what was workable in the environment in terms of my grandparents and the way they lived. And they lived in the city. So mm. everyone had victory gardens, for example. Well, that was partly because of the war. But anyways, I, I think it's an interesting history. And I think you know, bringing uh, people who are older than me or you know, in my, around my age uh, to be able to pass that down in mm. just in terms of this is normal. This is this is normal. There's yeah. actually a new project called yeah. Shades of Sustainability. Oh, okay. and it was just launched, I think, a couple of days ago. What? And they're asking for intergenerational stories about how um, how people used their own ways for climate action or sustainable use and recycling. And it's quite in interesting. They're doing a digital story on that. Shades of sustainable? Mm. Sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, they're asking for youth to connect with an older generation and asking them how they were sustainable That's so cool. in the past. Yeah, oh and then they're asking people to share their story and hopefully gaining a bigger audience mm. in that way. Yeah, so it's a new project, and if you're interested, you can submit a story to them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. But I mean, you know, for me, because I lived in an urban setting, yeah. and you know, uh, my mother had a, a, a what the what what are they called those washing machines? The ones that roll with the roller. Ringer. 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 There we go. <laughs> and uh, you know, you would use the water two two times. The whites would go in, and then the, you know all that sort of stuff. So those are those are. I think it. I think those stories. They're not meant to. 
to have people go back to that time, but to realize that it was not a big deal, and that when you go camping or something like that, you do those sorts of things. You you know you sort of you careful with the water and various things like that. So the stories act as a as a normalizing of culture. Sorry. There was kind of an interlude in the 60, late 60s and yeah. early 70s yeah. in sort of a, the countercultural communal kind of era yeah. when many people would gather together and buy bulk food together. Oh, I remember that. That's yeah, cool. and, then, and then out yeah. of that came co-ops yeah. where and it was, you know, shopping in Nada reminds me a little bit yeah. of shopping in uh, co-ops but um, but just to, to you know having shopped at Nada for some time now just a couple of things that really stand out for me one is I can see looking at the plastic blue box you know the you you, you separate out plastics you put them in one blue box mm -hmm. and 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 I can see now that the amount of plastic that I'm kicking out into recycling, so-called, and the blue boxes is, is reduced about two-thirds already. Wow. Okay. So, you know, it's a, it's, the other thing is, you know, yeah, you can, I mean, you can change gradually, but the, but it is, I would say not a, as much, uh, much a behavioral change mm -hmm. system as it is a, f a food delivery system. Yeah. And so, That's you know, cool. what I've learned uh, shopping at Nada is, and it's, it, it's a, it can be a real pleasant experience, is to slow down. You know, because my habit is to sort of whip into choices or capers, grab a few things, <laughs> go up to the counter and get out of there. But um, it's very speedy. And, but if I'm, when I'm shopping at Nada, or when Mary and I are shopping at Nada, then we have to take a few minutes and think mm -hmm. about what containers we need to take with us in order to buy the things that are on our shopping list. And then when you arrive, you have to take a few minutes to weigh your containers in the way you described. And it's like a little computer system, so yeah. it's kind of fun <laughs> once you learn how to use it. And then when you're actually purchasing, like shampoo, for example, mm -hmm. you know, there's a huge container with a little pump. And so you pump the, the shampoo out into your container. Well, you can't be speedy about that. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get shampoo, shampoo on your feet. <laughs> rather than in the container. Um, and so, before, yeah. and honey is even worse. <laughs> um, however, <laughs> you know, the, 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 I think slow, the slowing down is part of the pleasure, pleasure of the experience and that, you know, you, you feel so good because, you know, you know that you're not contributing more plastic trash or less, so. Um, anyway, that's a few what? observations. Yeah. I was wondering how responsive the suppliers were to your demands to provide their product in a new form without any wrap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it honestly, I mean, I'm not super involved in the supply side, but I will speak to it as best as I can. Um, it's real hit or miss, I think. That's so a lot of the brands that we have chosen to go with, like that was a big aspect in choosing them was whether or not they were willing to offer um, like some kind of bulk option like or and also kind of in, in pushing them or encouraging them to um, have like refillable containers as well like so they'll drop something off and then we use that container and then get that back to them and they refill it and give it back to us um, so it's how responsive they are to it, it, it like really depends, I think, on the supplier. Um, we can you sort of generalize and say, you know, fruits and vegetables kinds are easier to sort of move along. Yes. <laughs> yes, that is that's true. That's definitely true because it depends. Like there are some items that we found are a lot harder to do package free, right? That's um, for instance, like we don't offer a lot of meat products in store. Um, just because 
we don't have any kind of uh, packaging that includes, I mean, even though I think that the butcher's paper is, is pretty great in itself, um, we don't have that. So it all has to be contained in like little uh, Tupperware containers for the most part. And it's just there's, for certain items, there's more risk of food contamination. So yeah, it is, it is easier with like fruits and vegetables that kind of come with their own natural packaging. Um, or items that are not, they don't have like liquid in them. That's another thing that we're kind of looking into sourcing more of. So like dish, like basically if you have water in something, um, it, it, sorry, what's the word? It um, speeds up like bacterial growth and it also um, requires packaging at that point, right? If it has water in it, you have to have some kind of vessel. So that's where like shampoo bars are kind of a cool alternative or like you were talking about just wanting to have a bar of soap, just having it in a solid or powdered form and then you can just like add the water afterwards. That like a lot of times eliminates the need for packaging. So roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> yeah, I think what, what, you know, you know, the process, the transition through this will be maybe five to ten years if, um, if organizations like you and, and, and younger people who are, you know, at, who are worried about the climate crisis are willing to uh, shift their behavior, um, then the response to that will be uh, the people who will be able to pro provide a clean uh, transportation in terms of the bulk aspect of it, of things like honey and the, those sorts of things, that those are going to those are going to be more uh, or sellers will be more amenable to that as the as the trend shifts. I mean that's what we have to we have to look for is. It's, it's shifting behavior. Most of this is shifting behavior. Well, and it's, mm. it, is, it is backing up the supply chain. Yeah. Like I you know, had a yeah. meeting with uh, East Van Roasters, and I, I, they didn't know that I had connected with NADA. And one of the things that they were proud to share in the meeting was that they are a supplier a containerless supplier to yeah. NADA. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as as the supplier's values change, mm -hmm. then I think the, you know, the spectrum of, um, pl of, of plasticless and containerless suppliers will also expand. It's a good point. It makes, it's also a, an interesting position that you have as a um, retailer, right? Because you can put kind of pressure on suppliers to make those changes and mm -hmm. then you, you also function as an educational resource for the yeah, consumer. In part why I was asking because I was thinking if you guys as a single store mm -hmm. exercise that pressure then certainly the larger grocery stores in Canada um, should be able to have you need much greater uh, influence. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, yeah. why aren't they doing it? But it's still That's the question. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, I mean, from what I've talked to or what I've heard from people in the industry, it's that it's not really on their radar yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that is like, this, it's like, that's what's on, that's what's on the agenda for like major retailers. Um, but I think that's what, like, that's where something like this, like a small store like Nada can be really powerful because if enough people rally around it and it gets, the right kind of like media attention, for instance, like it'll show, it'll show people that this is something that matters. So the other thing is schools, because children, you've got that grade kindergarten through to say grade ten, um, and going into the going into the individual schools because the children will tell the parents, I mean, mm -hmm. Greta. Mm -hmm. Look at all the number of uh, young children that were attracted to the, it, well, well, some of them were too young to understand all of the issues, but they were um, presented with them. They, and uh, so they, uh, and smoking, smoking is another good uh, situation where children would, you know, tell their parents they didn't want them to smoke. So, you know, uh, educating and going into schools, I think, is 
your event situation. You're not, that's not your job. But at the same time, it may inspire other people to pick up uh, some of the slack and go into the school. Well, it's, it's also like, I think educators are, are mm -hmm. trying to get this into the curriculum in some way, like Very teaching much kids. Because so. this is going to be a huge. Teachers are really, really are doing a very good job of trying, just uh, especially around the environmental, you know, going out and, and being in nature and various things like that. But they take the schools out. So uh, I'd be looking at that. You'll get that, you get, is, if the children can talk to their parents, and their parents are aware, you're gonna, you know, the change will occur more quickly, I think. It, there is like a power, I think, in this singularness mm -hmm. of, of that view that it's like, this is wrong, mm -hmm. you know, like the, like the almost like more, I don't want to say simple, but just like the way that a kid would look at it, like this is wrong, why isn't someone doing anything about it? Um, as an adult, you start to like get muddled in, yeah, exactly, <laughs> muddled up in like nuance and complexity, and you're like, well, it's like this because of this. Yeah. You, you mean the Greta point of view? It's like, <laughs> exactly. don't be, Greta, don't be like, stupid. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and there's power to that, right? Yeah, like, there is. Are, then they're oh, like, wait, sure. why aren't we doing it? Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So, um, would, what advice would you give to someone who wants to stay motivated enough to go zero waste? Because I think a lot of people look for convenience and or assume that it's very time consuming mm -hmm. or it takes a lot of work or they have to buy things in order yeah. to be zero waste. Like, what would your advice be to that? Um, I think my first, like the way I'd advise like starting out if you're trying, if this is what you're, something you're trying to move into, it's like, it feels like a huge transition. It's like maybe not thinking about it as zero waste, mm -hmm. just, I don't know why it all, <laughs> it always has to be this like dichotomy of like all or nothing. It's like yes. you're either throwing everything away or you're throwing nothing away, but there's a transitional part <laughs> where you could be just trying to use less and that that I think is is most important it's not yeah it's not about right buying a bunch of new things for your zero waste lifestyle it's about like just using what you have until it's gone mm -hmm. until um, its life cycle is up and then like slowly and carefully thinking of ways that you can phase out those things um, and maybe replace them with something else you know and that's and that I think the the other thing is like an emphasis on buying used like that's really important um and i don't and as like a retail supplier i know we, we like have um new products in store that are great but it's also great <laughs> to go to your local thrift store and and find things there you know because there's tons of stuff you know i think what we need to do is create sort of a a zero waste for dummies kind of book. Mm -hmm. You know, that would, you know, say, okay, here's one easy step that you can take, and here's <laughs> the second one, and so forth, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah five and five R's are very important, right? Totally. And yeah. I think like yeah. small changes, yeah. I guess, like yeah. what we're talking about, like incremental, and it's a behavior thing, and it's, I think it's really. I guess advice, it's like really easy to get down on yourself and I feel like I do that a lot, like of feeling like guilt for not, you know, like for forgetting my reusable mug or something and then, oh, I guess I can't have coffee today. <laughs> but then, <laughs> but then it, it is like you do that enough times and then you start to remember. It's, a ha it's like ha it's habit forming, basic psychology. Yeah, I mean, it took me a while to get it to, you know, remember to take bags. Yeah. You know? I mean, it, that, and then took, that, that took about two months before I finally remember it all the time. Yeah, and then it's like, when, yeah. yeah, when you see the example in front of you, like, that's what you were talking about, like, behavioral changing and also, like, a consciousness shift. Then you yeah. become super, like, hyper-aware even of, mm -hmm. like, of like all of the waste that we're creating on a day-to-day -day basis and I think it can sometimes feel debilitating. Um, I know that I have those days where I'm just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> There's like nothing we can do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's just like continuing, I think. 
when we were talking, we talked a lot about containers. And, mm -hmm. um, but there's another thing that happens in, in mainstream grocery stores. The, the, the throw out of food food waste is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, is about 10 percent. What is not a tackling that problem and if so what are you doing? Yeah so like I like it showed in the presentation we have zero kilograms of waste that's gone to um, landfill and we do compost some food scraps that we can't use but for the most part we take all produce like no matter what it looks like and because people have preferences sometimes like the uglier things don't sell um, so we have we'll have like a 50% off kind of area in store so it's like then you have the option of getting something for less money if it looks a little different um, or it's closer to its expiry date um, and then if those don't sell then we have a package free cafe in store and actually a, a vegan chef and so she will take those surplus food items and make things for the cafe out of those so that's we have a daily harvest menu and it's it's actually like i think it's it cycles weekly but it's she makes a smoothie a soup and a salad from basically whatever we have in store that needs to get used up um she's amazing at just like coming up with crazy so you're, recipes you're live hmm? i mean because everybody's eating it <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting way of looking at it yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you don't even need a garbage bag. Yeah, and then, and then other, <laughs> besides, like, that's something we do in store, but, um... But it's a, it's a perfect pairing. Yeah, it ends up, it ends up working really yeah, well. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. its own little community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, it, like, and for whatever reason, if something is going off, I mean, we also kind of advise people to treat um, expiry dates or sell-by dates as a, as a guideline. <laughs> That's, they're often... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're often kind of arbitrary. Um, I don't know, like, use your senses. Be careful, of course, but it's like if something smells like it's okay. It's like yogurt, something that's already a little fermented. Um, it's probably fine. <laughs> We all, so we'll also like if we can't sell anything past its expiry date, of course, because mm -hmm. of regulations. But um, we will offer those things to staff as like free things. And so I have a lot of yogurt to get through actually right now. <laughs> 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 Yum. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh. Just one more question. For sure. Um, Naomi, do you, uh, did, I mean, you may not have analyzed this, but I wonder, is, do, do, is, do you think not as more labor intensive as a, you know, as, as a, an employer? Or? A, yeah, as a, as a, well, just looking <laughs> at it as a food delivery system. As a food delivery system? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not what's easy, right? That's, mm -hmm. I think, I think it's, we, we are used to a certain kind of convenience, um, but that convenience is having consequences. serious consequences. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think there, is, there is more work involved, but I think, I don't know, you put, you put more love and energy in it, to it. And when you start caring about something like this, then that work doesn't feel as hard. Like, I, I mean, I, I, talking about it as like a, like a store, from a store management perspective, um, yeah, it's like a lot more work to not use like whatever paper towels and wipe up spills and we actually, you know, like have cloth napkins and then they have to get like washed out regularly and then there's days where like all the cloth napkins are dirty and <laughs> we have to like run to the um, laundromat. But yeah, it's, it's you, you get used to it and you care about it and I think it, it's way more uh, valuable than any other retail experience I've had. The people are closer and they really care. And so it's a whole different difference. experience to go into the store. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, as a shopper, you feel immediately that the people who are there really care about providing the best of service in this way to you. And it's, it's, it's really... Yeah, it's like everyone who works there, it feels like they 
yeah. they take that on and they, they can, like, yeah, and if you're having trouble themselves. with something you can get help very mm -hmm. easily but the other way to look at it I suppose would be to say it provides more employment yeah I was, I was thinking about mm -hmm. that myself yeah uh, um, yeah because it is more labor intensive in a sense mm -hmm. um, it leaves the door open for opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, th I think that's a, a, a good motivation. Yeah, that's a really mm -hmm. interesting yeah. point. Yeah. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. But. Because, and, and you know, when you look at the cycle of it, so it's its, its own little, like I said, composter, sort of, where, where but it's organic. Organic in, in, in the way in which it goes and well, mm -hmm. is, it, is, the, is the food all organic or not? Uh, <laughs> that's, we, my answer to that is, it's, I don't know, or, organic is a whole different topic. <laughs> okay. But um, we that's don't, it's, we do offer a lot of organic yeah. uh, products in store, but if we don't, if something isn't organic, I think what's almost more important to us is that it be um, produced using kind of like organic practices if that makes any sense so yeah like smaller smaller farms or like regenerative agriculture or that they like it's not that organic isn't valuable it's that there are other things other parts of it's expensive and there are other parts of production that are equally important that are maybe discounted you know like you might have something organically produced but it's like on a massive scale and it's you know, when you get Death to a climate an crisis, those or... sorts of debates are worthy, but um, aren't very useful, I don't think, because your focus has changed a little bit in terms of, at least for this time, in this transition. Mm -hmm. And so we can't apply the same kinds of expectations if we are going to change. I think maybe local is yeah. equally or more important. Yeah. 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 I mean, when you think of what's happening in California, or has just oh. been happening, and consider that 80% of our produce comes from California. Right. Yeah. Well, their, their capacity to produce uh, fruits and vegetables is going to be continu continuously diminished. Right. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to learn how to do it ourselves uh, much more. We may be growing our own oranges. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, oh for sure, <laughs> for sure. That was the fun thing about um, Dan Jason from Salt Spring Seeds because oh, yeah. he 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 the way he got started was with soybeans, mm -hmm. and and because his question was back then, forty years ago, when people were first becoming vegetarians and looking to soy products, could we grow soybeans here? No, it's impossible, it's too cold. And so he, he didn't believe them. So mm -hmm. he started trying out different strains of oh, soybeans and found some that grow beautifully here. And so he has, on Salt Spring Island, on his farm, a whole field of soybeans. Wow. And chickpeas. I've been, I've been talking about yeah. chickpeas. So yeah. great. Because I was surprised about chickpeas. Yeah. It's yeah. surprising, uh, you know, what, to, what you can do. Not, not in all areas of BC, but at least uh, sure. you, know, you, could, you could have regions that yeah. have, um, you know, specialized in certain things and then you're sharing. Yep. So we're all going to become farmers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was thinking also one other thing about a grocery hub. Like one of the things that um, we talked about when when we had that presentation from yeah. Jeff Lee, and he was talking about cargo bikes and how mm -hmm. their job would be to to go. Uh, so their pedal assist, this is the deal. And the focus is to get less cars on the highways and or, or, or the inner city. And so the idea is to have these cargo bikes, which are basically big 
you know, you'll see, you'll see them now even, the guys who are right now on their cycles and just have things on their backs, but they're also going to have uh, these great big boxes anyways, uh, and um, which are attached to a bike. So that the cargo bikes go to a hub and they uh, are then loaded up for uh, some with for commodities for small businesses and they uh, and then they so you're not getting big trucks so where am I going with that so um, the vegetables and uh, I looking at um, I just got I actually moved it down grocery hubs mm -hmm. so you were talking about like yours one store it's on Fraser and Broadway. So uh, the idea being is that if there were more of, uh, of we, you know, with that program and, and that attitude, uh, but so you would you consider yourself to be hubs. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and people could come and get their groceries. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, just the fact that you have to go into a car and then transport your food to Point Grey or down to, you know, um, that is a problem. But if you can walk to it, it's, you're much more, it's much more amenable to mm -hmm. using... Um, Having small community yeah, grocery small stores yeah. that people like can it, access. It, you know, mm -hmm. the um, corner gro grocery stores a long time ago, uh, which is not, I think the only one we've got is like just over a block or two. Mm. I mean, they've got ice cream and stuff like that now, and not packaged stuff, but groceries were actually uh, groceries. They had outside, we would have vegetables and various things like that. But that was a long time ago. And, and actually, I remember um, people coming from the valley, uh, and they would have trucks, and they would just come into the neighborhoods with, with milk and various vegetables and things, and and um, the you know people in the neighborhood would come and buy the groceries right there. Mm -hmm. So so those are sorts of things that enhance production, and also you know people have jobs. I, I could actually talk to you later about that. There's some things happening with that, but um, I just want to make sure that all of the, all of you have. Do you have any questions? So, uh, or comments. Oh, I do have a question. Yeah. I was wondering what else do you guys kind of do um, in terms of like running the store that like sustainable practice and like, do you do like training with your employees or stuff like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a, um, that's a big part of it. It's also um, like sustainable practices in store. Uh, we have that kind of like built into our store operations manual and it involves like, you know, some stores will like leave their lights on at night, like we turn all of our lights off, of course. And we also um, use uh, like a, sorry, I'm trying to remember what the word for this would be, but our like waste management partner or service that we use um, is called Recycling Alternative. And so they, actually like they help us by um, sorting all of all of the waste that we produce in store and making sure that it goes to the proper places um, it's like an alternative to mm -hmm. and how often do you see that's a good question um, it's kind of been I think inconsistent for the last sporadic for the last little while I think um, we're working on getting it to a place where it's coming out bi-weekly, um, but yeah, I think I think right now it might be like once a month, twice a month. Have you, has that usually been your experience? Are you on the newsletter? Or? Okay, yeah. Become it'll and it usually it'll talk about things that are happening in store and like events that are coming up, which is also going to be on social media. And, and I'm just wondering about the range of products. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. compared to a standard grocery store, what the, the town of me wouldn't be there, which is just product for me. Thing. Yeah, I mean, we but, we um, do offer like fish and some like preserved meats, <laughs> um, so like some like chorizo and stuff that are that are locally sourced. Um, but yeah, we try to offer as many things as possible that a typical grocery store would. It depends what you're looking for. Like we don't have. 
a ton of, we have like more than you'd expect, I would say like snacking options. Like we do have some, some crackers and candy and chocolate and things like that. Um, and but it, we, it's all, it's all like a bulk setup, oh. right? So it's, it's, it's rows of bins, um, and, or like different kinds of receptacles, but basically it's like you, you know, scoop out however much you want and put it into your container. Um, but I'd say some of the, we've also tried to fill the need for like, like less kind of conventional bulk items, I think, like, for example, condiments. I think that's one thing like people are like, oh, I want mustard still, or like mayonnaise or whatever. Um, so we make a lot of those things in-house. We, a lot of the things that it would be really hard to get from a supplier, we will make on site. So um, we make cashew milk and oat milk oh, in store. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a mayonnaise as well, and like salad how, dressing. How long do those last usually? I mean, yours, so they presumably they don't have preservatives. They don't, yeah, you're right. It, I think, I, I mean, it, it's not as long as the ones that come in, you know, like a Tetra pack or something, but I, I been told like yeah it, it yeah it depends um, on when it was made and stuff but I I've, I've like used I've gotten like a little jar of cashew milk this is um, anecdotal evidence and had it for like a week and a half and then used it and it was fine so and you can also like write when you got it when it was made like the expiry on top of you can ask the person in the cafe to do that that can be helpful as well and then how do your prices compare? I'm really, mm -hmm. I'm really curious about it's a it's a wide range. There are some things I mean, there are some things that are I think less expensive than a conventional grocery store. I know that we have cheaper avocados for whatever reason some of the time and um, but I the there are like the the issue right is that it's not cheap because cheaply produced food um, is, tends to be like exploitative and <laughs> everything bad, like um, fast fashion, for instance, and that kind of industry. But um, yeah, it's, it's like, I guess on the whole, like more expensive, but you can get smaller amounts of it, um, of any particular item. Like you can, you only, you only need to buy as much as you're going to eat, right? So if you just are making a recipe that calls for a few leaves of basil, you don't have to buy the entire container, which yeah, would be a lot more expensive. Drive, right? Yeah, right. yeah. So there's the trade-off. Mm -hmm. For now. For now. Yeah. Here's a, here's a couple of fun things that I didn't expect to be able to get it. Not a, um, Mary, my, my wife's favorite lip balm. Yeah. Not oh, a, um, <laughs> and uh, about price and funny things, I have a jar of toothpaste that I bought oh, at NADA. And I'm, I'm sure that I would have gone through three or four tubes yeah. of yeah. toothpaste yeah. And, and the time that I've had mm -hmm. this jar that I've been working on, you know. And so that's kind of fun. But finally, the best tortillas in town. <laughs> no question about it. No, the tortillas, I'm trying to remember who the supplier is. I'm sorry, I don't have as much of that. They come in a bucket, I don't know. Yeah, they come they in a come from bucket, that. they're great. They're <laughs> You're really right. good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, they're just like separated by like a small sheet of paper. And yeah, just... yeah, and you have to count them. Yes, yes you do. You take <laughs> the them. first time I just grabbed <laughs> You just grab a bunch, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, how many? <laughs> and it's good about the toothpaste, you can make that at home too. You can make a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If that's, if that's an option for you to buy your cookies at home. That's, yeah, that's a really well, good point. Well, you know, there used to be toothpaste that was powder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. have to wet your brush and then put it in. Yeah. 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 Oh, for sure. That's another move. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have a very basic question. Uh, I, I'm wondering uh, if you can uh, tell me how can I, how I can reduce a plastic wrap from my kitchen. I, I know this this may sound very simple, but I uh, every time I got you know big onions or tomatoes, mm -hmm. and difficult to uh, resist the habit to put the plastic wrap on the surface and and that surface. Yeah, I totally understand. Um, and I would say like. 
there are tons of alternatives. There's lots of things that you can find online, but some of the ones that I use and we rec like we have the beeswax wraps, right? Like that you can buy, and it's an al alternative. It's made from cloth and um, beeswax and pine resin, and those are great. They last a really long time, and they actually kind of like let food breathe. But if that's expensive, or if you don't want to buy something new, if that's um, just using a plate and putting the cut side of whatever it is down on the plate, that's often what I'll do. <laughs> yeah, or... Um, Reuse and re and wash it. <laughs> that too. And then if you, if you are going to use some kind of, yeah, or if you are going to choose between those kinds of, of like food preservation methods, uh, tin foil is, yeah. is a preferable alternative because it can be recycled and aluminum is recycled. I think they also have well. like silicone ones where they have like stretchy yeah. silicone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. true. Yeah, there's also those like, those, uh, if you, you have like That's bowls great. and stuff. That's on Instagram. <laughs> But you could make them too, right? You could make like a like a cloth with like a elastic around the rim, and then just use that to or cover up bowls and stuff. Or, or you old you shine that. Ooh. Well, yeah, that's right. So you've got them in a bowl, and then you use the shower cap for the top, and it's reusable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Plus, they used to they used to sell them. Mm -hmm. uh, in different sizes, yeah. um, but I haven't yeah. seen very many anymore. But you know, the beeswax works well, and you can just wash them gently. Right. Uh, so even even if you, like I use them all the time, and if I have an onion, and you know, onions are if they're you know, if you have them in the refrigerator for a couple of days, it, there's a the scent of onion. But if you just put them under sort of mild water uh, temperature. And it was just soap. Mm -hmm. And then they, they clean up pretty well. Mm -hmm. Very well, I have to say. That should be a part of a habit. Behavior change. That's like, a, that's a big one though, right? And, and yeah, is like you use it for a lot of things. It's hard for baking, I know. I know a lot of bakers who are always like looking for, they'll use like cloth or something instead because so much of that you're just like using plastic wrap constantly. Did they do that in France? You know, when you think of all the French baking and everything, they didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. But people are used I to it now, yeah. Zero waste baking. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys for coming. That was really thank fun. Thank you.